going to try and not go to my Jersey roots and talk too fast, <laughs> but I, I have a lot to cover in an hour. The first time I did this presentation was three hours long, so I've uh, whittled down quite a bit, but uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think, valuable substantive content in here. So I'm just going to jump right in, okay? Uh, Substance Use Mental Health Services Administration defines trauma in the following way, okay? It uh, results from an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by the individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. I like the way they sum it up, actually. Uh, in short, trauma is the sum of the event, the experience, and the mm -hmm. effect. I think of the concept of gestalt, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's the way SAMHSA de defines trauma. So I just want to lay a foundation of, you know, how we define trauma and um, before we get into the uh, intergenerational trauma aspects of breaking the chain. <clears throat> Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration talks about PTSD's prevalence. The uh, lifetime prevalence of PTSD among adults in the United States is about 8%. And again, this is, these are government-based statistics. Then they go on to say that the rate of PTSD among people with substance use disorders is 12 to 34 percent. Now, uh, Shay has informed me. I know who's the type of uh, clinicians that are listening to this are folks like myself who work in this field, and, and I suspect you're going to have the same reaction as me. That unfortunately, uh, we tend those of us who tend to deal with individuals who have trauma and substance use find higher rates uh, percentages than this. Actually, uh, I've been collecting data, uh, data and doing psychological assessments at the refuge for about four years now. And I went back and did a forensic review of uh, some of the clients that I did uh, intake uh, evaluations on in 2012. In 2012, I, I looked back and I took a sample of 69 clients that I did comprehensive assessments on. And uh, of those 69 clients, in terms of the diagnostic impressions that I concluded based on the uh, comprehensive assessment, 69 uh, uh, of, this, of the 69 clients, only 16 of those clients did not have PTSD, which left 53 of those clients that did have PTSD. And of those 53 clients, 52 of the 53 clients had mm -hmm. PTSD and some substance use disorder. That, to me, is, is astronomical. I mean, if you look at the, what uh, SAMHSA is saying is that uh, in general, the field is treating anywhere from 50 to 400 percent more uh, individuals with PTSD than you'll find in the general population. A at least at the mm -hmm. refuge in 2012, mm -hmm. based on my diagnostic criteria, 52 out of 53 people had the comorbid trauma and substance use disorder. Again, I suspect that a number of you are finding uh, higher percentages like that also. So how do we define trauma from the kind of, uh, within the context of the refuge culture, uh, Judy Crane uh, just defined uh, the uh, concept of, of trauma as being very visceral, it's sensory, and it's cellular, okay? So traumatic events occur not only situationally outside of the individual, but they're experienced internally within the individual. And for those of us that uh, have worked with individuals that have trauma and substance use disorders, we know that it even goes beyond the cellular level. It becomes more of a soul wound. And that's what we're going to be talking about when we, when we cross over to the intergenerational trauma, the transmission of this soul wound from one generation to the next. I think when I think of trauma and when I take a look at 52 out of 53 patients had, uh, that I evaluated in, in uh, 2012 had PTSD and, and substance use disorders, the comorbidity, I think that traumatic events are extraordinary, unfortunately not because they occur rarely, but um, because they overwhelm the ordinary adaptations that individuals have to live life on life's terms. If you take a look at it from a Darwinian perspective, uh, uh, the combination of trauma and substance use disorder incapacitates the individual so as I don't want to make light of this but it's kind of like if you're watching a National Geographic film and there's that one gazelle that's limping in the back of the herd and and they go mm -hmm. by a bunch of lions you know you know which which animal is going to fall prey to the to the uh, perpetrators and that's what kind of happens with <clears throat> people that suffer from trauma so let's take a look at uh, trauma has two components it has the psychological trauma which is experienced as an emotional state of discomfort and stress, 
resulting from memories of the extraordinary catastrophic experience which shattered the survivor's sense of invulnerability to harm. Uh, beyond the fact that you're all licensed uh, clinicians and working in the field and working with individuals that have trauma and addiction, um, I suspect that many of you are parents. And one of the beautiful things, as, as am I, and one of the beautiful things of, of, of being a pa parent early on is your child is, is so um, uh, oblivious to any potential harm because the child comes into the world so totally dependent on the mother, first and foremost, and the parental uh, structure and the adult structure to protect them and to keep them safe from harm. And for those individuals that are brought into the world and establish a safety foundation, it becomes unbearable for them to be traumatized by an event that is inconsistent with what they were um, familiar with as a child. <clears throat> What they were talking, now we're going to make the, the transition to the behavioral side of it. Behavior, uh, behaviorally, you know that you can look at PTSD based on uh, how they deal with the stressors. You know, uh, immediately after the catastrophic event, individuals will have a number of different uh, symptoms that are similar in terms of being um, traumatized. They will dissociate sometimes, they'll become immobilized, uh, uh, become overwhelmed with affect and uh, cognitive ruminations of the event and all the PTSD symptoms that you know are, are part of the DSM-5 criteria, okay? We might, we're going to jump into uh, the uh, historical uh, component that's cross-generational, I'm sorry, transgenerational trauma now at this point. And um, I think that uh, the way that I'd like to lay the foundation for how we define this is that transgenerational trauma is a trauma that was transferred from the first generation of survivors that have experienced or witnessed it directly in the past to the second and further generations of offspring of the survivors via complex post-traumatic stress disorder mechanisms. Uh, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, I guess it's been a, a couple of years now since I started doing the research and preparing for this kind of presentation as I've done it for the refuge in a number of places. Um, I hadn't heard of that concept of complex post-traumatic stress disorder mechanisms and it's uh, defined as uh, multiple interrelated post-traumatic stress disorder that is psychological injury that results from protracted exposure to prolonged social and or interpersonal trauma. So I think many of the clients that we treat here at the Refuge and that you treat in your facilities, one trauma is enough. I, I, I think anyone is, is subjected to one traumatic experience, be it physical or, or sexual, however the perpetration is imposed on the victim is, is too much. Unfortunately, we see too many of our clients and patients here, especially at the refuge, that have been exposed to chronic perpetuated trauma on them. And so it becomes um, one and one does not equal two. One and one equals five in this case. The more trauma, the more uh, uh, complex the uh, etiology is, the more complex it is integrated into their psychic personality development. So let's take a look at the historical etiology of intergenerational trauma. Um, this all started with what was coined as the concentration camp syndrome or survivor syndrome observed by clinicians in 1966 as a result of the large number of children of Holocaust survivors who were seeking treatment in clinics in Canada. Let's you know, take a look at history. I mean, this is, this is the generation post-World War II children of those who sur uh, survived the Holocaust and were overrepresented in need of treatment, psychological treatment. The grandchildren of Holocaust survivors were overrepresented by 300% among the referrals of child psychiatry in a clinic in comparison to their representative sample. Okay. Uh, the, the problem here is that it's, it's so obvious when you take a look at it uh, statistically and just uh, uh, res from a research perspective that uh, there's, there's, there's not just a correlation here. I believe there's a causal effect, that there's a, there is an impartation of Im immeasurable trauma imposed upon the survivors of the Holocaust, and then that is that story, that theme, that, that, uh, that reaction to that trauma is passed on to other generations. So what we have here is that the parents are being affected directly or indirectly by their parents' post-traumatic symptoms. And that's called secondary trauma, traumatization, or second-generation trauma. Okay. Um, 
goes to the third generation, and, and actually it's tracked out. They've tracked, done some research and tracked it all the way out to five generations post-trauma that they've seen effects in the uh, trauma transmission, okay? Trauma and rebirth. Um, Long-term consequences of Holocaust and survivors and subsequent generations for many causes of impairment and dysfunction. However, the important thing to realize here is there really are Holocaust survivors who have gone through this unimaginable trauma and have actually um, been able to, you know, respond, overcoming the incapacitating impact of their victimization. So there is some variance. Uh, and the good news is, especially with this, this research with respect to uh, trauma survivors from the Holocaust, is that there are some people that have turned that into something positive. I, the person that comes to mind for me is Viktor Frankl, uh, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, uh, the Austrian analyst, Jewish analyst, who was captured and, and sent to a concentration camp. And uh, if my memory serves me correctly, the story went something like the, uh, the Nazi uh, officers came in and, and he stripped him of his, you know, all of his three-piece suit, his nice attire, uh, took all of his um, uh, diplomas off the wall. Uh, he even had a family heirloom, I believe, from his grandfather, a pocket watch they took from him, stripped him naked and, and put him in a concentration camp. And he said that, you know, in his, in his book, that they could take everything from him, his status, his wealth, his financial independence and security, and his, and his, his value to the community at large as an, an analyst, but they couldn't take his freedom and dignity. And those people that held on to that are the ones that actually survived the Holocaust trauma. So I think that what happened to some of the survivors of the Holocaust is after the, quote, crisis was over and the war was over, some individuals then allowed themselves the freedom to have, for lack of a better term, a meltdown or a, a, a delayed post-traumatic reaction. And this is what the second generation children were exposed to. Okay, let's take a look at it from the mental health perspective, okay? Um, between 2004 and 2005, there was this uh, individual, uh, Dr. Menzies, that conducted research on a group of Aboriginal men, <coughs> excuse me, uh, from Canada in an effort to identify links between homelessness and intergenerational trauma. This was a small sample. I believe it was like 60 men. There it is. 60 men at a... Uh, a uh, homeless shelter in downtown Toronto. Uh, so one could argue that the conclusions derived from this research are uh, maybe somewhat specific to this population, but I think that they are legitimate enough to generalize to the population at large when he took a look at these uh, Aboriginal men from Canada. Let's take a look at it from a mental health perspective. Many of these men um, were unable to provide details of their own genealogy in part due to the most of them having been removed from their homes at an early age. They, they, they were disassociated from their genetic and cultural heritage by placements in, uh, in schools, residential schools and the like. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But <clears throat> however, they were very much able to recall details of their experience within the context of the residential school experience Child Welfare Authority, and the impact these systems had on their personal identity. Um, a couple of individuals from this uh, sample of 60 men at the homeless shelter in Toronto, one gentleman stated, quote, my mother went to residential school, so this is a second generation uh, Aboriginal gentleman speaking uh, in Canada. His mother was the one who was in the uh, residential school. He says, my mother went to residential school. She did exactly what those people did to her in residential school. She was abusive. Violence begets violence. For this uh, gentleman, he was on the receiving end of that. Another gentleman actually, actually talked about, probably an older gentleman, uh, he talked about his experience uh, who, after he had attended residential school. He said he had been in residential school between the ages of 5 through 11, and this is what he had to say. Quote, I used to watch those movies, you know, back then about the kids with their parents, you know, like Leave it to Beaver or something like that. Yeah. You know, I saw him hugging his mom, and I tried that once. I tried to hug my mom, and when I hugged her and all that, actually, I told her I loved her, and she didn't know how to react. She didn't know how to take it, you know? So after that, I just shut myself off from her. That's tragic, and, and I think it, it, there would be no argument amongst, amongst any of us 
that even though violence begets violence, there's no excuse for inflicting pain and harm on any um, child or, or woman or adult for any reason. Having said that, this, this gentleman is sharing how the trauma affected him, not from being physically abused or sexually abused, but from being abandoned of the connection with his, with his mother. And we do a lot of work here at the refuge uh, with respect to attachment or, or attachment-related difficulties, avoidance, anxious attachment, individuals that develop these um, attachment-related difficulties resulting from their trauma. I would argue that this gentleman probably went beyond shutting himself off from his mother. I suspect he shut himself off from the world at large. The other problem here that happened in Canada um, during this period of time is that the Canadians' social policy, they created institutions, and again, um, they were mostly of Christian religious persuasion, and I, I mean no disservice to um, the belief system of Christianity or the missionaries that have given their lives and hearts to, to uh, further their belief system in the world. So these are people that are well-intentioned, you know, and for the right reasons, they take these, these kids into their homes. But unfortunately, um, post-residential uh, home experience and uh, welfare placement, uh, a lot of these uh, children had been cut off from their own uh, heritage and culture that had been a part of their culture for thousands of years and were forced to be integrated into a culture that was alien to them. And that was part of the trauma that was propitiated on them. What happened is, um, before we get into, okay, me, before we get into the mental health problems uh, slide, there's one other thing I want to address, and that is historically there was, a, in Canada, there was an Indian Act in, uh, uh, that uh, was activated in 1876. And this is where the government then was empowered to take these children from their homes. So numerous residential staff across Canada after this whole experience, as I said, were, were prosecuted for violations to these children. So not only were they taken from their heritage and their culture, but they were put in other situations where, the, where they were further victimized. Having said all that, they've derived some conclusions on, about mental health problems related from these Canadian Aboriginals. These aboriginals have higher rates of suicide when compared to the national average. Comorbid disorders of aboriginals is estimated to be up around 70% of the population. Um, that's high, and, but as I said earlier, the, the population at the refuge, 52 out of 53 people had PTSD and a substance use disorder, comorbid. Every single person I've ever evaluated, 100% of the people that I've evaluated at the refuge over the last four years, have all had complicated comorbid disorders. Again, I'm preaching to the choir. I suspect that everyone listening to me is saying, that's, that's who we treat, okay? It becomes very difficult to, I mean, we can diagnose people, we can label people, we can follow with the criteria of DSM-4, TR now DSM-5, uh, but just because we can isolate and identify the diagnostic criteria that make up a certain clinical presentation, it doesn't mean that we then have uh, a homogenized treatment plan or solution for each individual. We have to take each, that's what the whole concept of individual treatment planning is all about. Uh, we have to take a look at each individual. But in terms of cross-generational, intergenerational trauma, there are some similar themes. Uh, the Indian Act of 1876 was uh, uh, laid the foundation for what happened in the 1960s in Canada. Children were permanently removed from their homes and placed in foster care and made uh, crown wards, or what we would call here in Florida, wards of the state. And so up to year 2006, by 2006, there were close to 27,000 children in the care of child welfare agencies in Canada. Uh, many of Aboriginal uh, descent. Now, having looked at that, <clears throat> these are the problems that they have. Higher levels of depression for Aboriginals, two to six times more likely to use alcohol than non-Aboriginals. Okay, now we're looking at Aboriginal youth, and we all know, those of us who are working in the substance abuse field, the younger the child gets involved in substance use, the higher the correlation between uh, chronicity of substance use later on in life and the more serious. Now, in DSM-5 terms, uh, anyone uh, in a youth who gets involved in a substance use disorder, say, at age 13, is probably running a higher risk of being a substance use disorder severe in adulthood. Take a look at the related effects of PTSD on natives, native peoples. Um, Again, I think that this is 
something you can you can uh, exponentially uh, extrapolate and apply to anyone suffering from PTSD. But the Native peoples in in this particular research study had higher rates of depression, anger, psychic numbing, you know, anesthetized themselves. And the, and the problem with the comorbidity of, of alcohol or drug abuse, in addition to TH, uh, in, in addition to PTSD, is that the initial use of alcohol and drugs um, in the individual, the victim of PTSD, does have, a, quote, for lack of a better term, a therapeutic effect with respect to psychic numbing. Um, I know uh, that most addicts, it is my opinion, do not drink or drug in order to get high. I think most addicts drink or drug in order to not feel. And, and so what happens is for the traumatized individuals is they're able to experience this psychic numbing even without engaging in substance abuse, but substance abuse makes it much easier to sustain and maintain. Hypervigilance, right out of PTSD. Fixation on the trauma. Um, a lot of people repress the trauma, and it, it takes a, a lot of, you know, uh, uh, guided imagery, deep breathing exercises, relaxation therapy, a number of different modalities that are used here um, a somatic uh, experience that are used here at the refuge for people that have repressed memories to come to the surface. But the other problem is, is that some people actually ruminate on it and they re-traumatize themselves through propitiating the trauma that was imposed on them by, by their perpetrator. Somatization, survivor guilt. Uh, some people get out alive, um, wounded, broken in many ways. <laughs> You are now unmuted. You are now muted. We had a little technological difficulty, but can everyone still hear me? I trust you can. Um, I'm going to keep going, all right? <clears throat> Survivor guilt, victim identity. Uh, it's a fine line, and this is, this is me, Tom Antek speaking. I don't know if I'm speaking for the refuge or, or for any other institution. I'll just own this myself. I, I think it's a fine line between coming to terms with the reality that, yes, I am a victim or a, or a survivor of trauma and abuse, and, and then making that your life persona. Um, unfortunately, I've had the privileged opportunity to work with many veterans, and we have a couple of really great institutions. I, I practice in Tampa that treat veterans in Tampa, and uh, some of the Vietnam vets, for example, um, have, seems to me, uh, been identified as vic trauma victims throughout the course of their life, which in fact they are. And when, by the time they get to my office and they're on disability and I have to do some assessment and evaluating with them, I absolutely acknowledge and recognize that they are uh, survivors of chronic um, PTSD. However, my hope is, and, and what I think we try to do with the, the refuge is, we try to instill hope where hope doesn't exist. Now, my, my hope is for every client that I meet with is that they can develop an identity that, that doesn't necessarily um, repress or suppress the, the, the victimization history, but encompasses other things such as being a, a husband or a wife or a mother or a father or a son or a brother or a sister or a, uh, uh, having some kind of vocational identity or um, community identity of service. I, and unfortunately, a lot of the uh, Native peoples especially have, uh, who have been designated on these reservations uh, seem to put a lot of time and energy in their victimization identity. And that's I, I mean no disrespect to people that suffer from that because I'm not walking in their shoes. So I'm just making a clinical observation. Revictimization by those in authority. I mentioned uh, earlier that numerous uh, people from uh, Canada were held uh, accountable for, the per for, per for their own personal involvement in physical and sexual abuse on the Aboriginal children that were put in their care. Fear of authority and intimacy. Um, this is what I mentioned earlier that a lot of the trauma uh, survivors here at the refuge have all kinds of issues related to attachment and so a lot of the work that we do here is trying to first identify what the difficulties are with respect to attachment and then to um, develop some strategies for helping them uh, remediate those problems whether it be avoidance or anxiety because those kinds of things will interfere with the development of intimacy for obvious reasons 
domestic and lateral violence. That's perpetuating violence begets violence. <clears throat> okay, we're going to take a look now at the four uh, domains of uh, the impact uh, of intergenerational trauma. Uh, the first one is individual indicators. Lack of sense of belonging with diminished capacity to affiliate with a specific family, community, culture, or nation. I don't believe that some of these indicators, I'll preface this by saying, I don't think this is neurotic. I think this is reality-based on their, on their traumatization. Um, who wants to belong to any kind of system, family, culture, organization, be it welfare system or school, uh, when in fact that, that particular system or individuals who are representatives of that system further perpetuate violence upon you, you know. So you separate and you insulate and you isolate from these people. Feelings of being abandoned by caregivers. Again, not in a, well, um, in the case of the Canadian and, and also the Native American and, and, and other cultures, the, I, I don't know if it's so much abandonment by the caregivers, but the caregivers had to give up their children in many cases, but the child perceives it as abandonment. Nonetheless, that impacts their sense of identity throughout the, their mm -hmm. early childhood. Limited or no information about one's culture of birth, including language, customs, beliefs, and spirituality. Remember we talked about how these Native Americans in the uh, study in Toronto couldn't uh, recall anything from their heritage, but they could recall things from their, their school experience. Inability to sustain personal or intimate relationships. Low self-esteem. Limited education or employment history. Uh, one could argue about the low self-esteem or interpersonal relationships thing because those are, those are perhaps subjective measures, but the education and employment history is statistical data. Um, people that have been traumatized and are, are re-victimized through intergenerational trauma tend to be underachievers in school and in the workforce. History of substance misuse. History of involvement in a criminal justice system. Um, and involvement in the mental health system. Their needs for individuals who fit these criteria of intergenerational trauma are so comprehensive in scope, and we're going to take a look at that at the end of this presentation when we look at the Native American Red Road to Well uh, solution for dealing with trauma. But they need, they need physical intervention, they need psychological intervention, they need medical intervention many times, and they need uh, the resources, full resources of the mental health system. How does this uh, uh, intergenerational trauma impact the domain of family? There's chronic and episodic family violence, including physical, sexual, emotional, or verbal abuse of children by adults in the household. Violence begets violence. Lack of emotional bonding between parents, siblings, and extended family members. Remember the one gentleman who said his mother, you know, basically couldn't handle his expression of love. This poor child. The child took the courage to, you know, take the risk to reach out to his mother and, you know, with, with all due respect to the mother, I have no idea how significant her trauma was by being in the residential schools, but it was significant enough for her to miss that opportunity to connect with her child and it impacted him for the rest of his life to the point where he was in a homeless uh, shelter at, at, as an adult. I'm not suggesting it uh, in an analytic sense. It was all his mother's fault by no stretch of the imagination, but that certainly was one piece of the clinical picture. Denial of cultural heritage by older family members, okay? Irregular contact or the absence of contact with caregiver family members. Evident and extensive alcohol drug abuse that crosses the generations. This is uh, mm -hmm. evident in, in the families. And we know any, even beyond families that uh, meet the criteria for intergenerational trauma, anytime there's substance use by one individual in the family, it creates uh, it, 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 an imbalance in the homeostasis of the family system. We see this also many times when we treat individuals who are addicts and, and they get sober. You'll, you notice many times that that throws the sobriety and recovery journey of the individual who is identified as the patient and addict throws off the homeostasis of the dysfunctional family that was used to treating this member as a sick, broken vessel. Now, the other members have to take a look at their contribution to not necessarily that person's addiction, but the dysfunction in the family. So it becomes quite complicated from a family perspective. Community indicators. Unconcealed alcohol and drug abuse among community members. 
uh, for those of us of European descent and who live in, uh, you know, suburban environments and upper socioeconomic strata, uh, we are not prone to being uh, very open and forthright with our with the, the amount of alcohol that we use. M I, I, many of us uh, who are in recovery have stories of, yes, I would, I would drink a couple of shots before I went to the social event just to get a little lubricated and, and so as not to... Uh, tip to people that I was, I was overextending myself with my alcohol consumption. But in, in, in these in, in Native American communities, they just, it's, you know, it's rampant, so rampant they don't even try to hide it. Lack of cultural opportunities. Low levels of social capital, including trust, reciprocal helping relationships, and social engagement. These are all impacts on the community level. So remember, this, this, it's like that concept, the butterfly flaps its wings and somewhere in, in, the, in the world there's a hurricane. Uh, the trauma that was affected up to five generations before, you know, is being manifest in, by these ways in the community. Again, the Red Road to Obriety will address the impact on the community from the trauma. National indicators. Popularization, popularization of negative stereotypes through mainstream media. Um, I remember, I'm not a big sports fan, uh, but uh, some, I don't know if, it, and uh, forgive me if I'm offending anybody, I don't know if it was the Atlanta Braves or the Cleveland Indians, but they had this tomahawk chop uh, thing, the whole, everybody in the whole stadium would do this, this thing, and, and, you know, for those of us who are working in this field and having this discussion, it's just so abrasive and so politically incorrect to even suggest that, that people would do that, but that's, that's, part of what's happened in our culture. Hopefully, uh, we ambassadors are trying to change some of that mentality. Social policies that perpetuate colonization of peoples on an individual people, uh, individual family and community basis. Uh, for example, the reservations that were designated for Native Americans, segregation of white black cultures prior to the civil rights movement with white race being valued and people of color being negatively valued. Uh, it's historically always been the, the uh, uh, European dominant majority culture has always wound up on top. And, and that's part of what happens when, when you profile and you, you stereotype, uh, you know, negative uh, indicators on entire races of people. They're devalued. Lack of support for holistic programs and services to the minority culture. I think it's Interesting, take a look at now that the DSM-5 is out and we've got some new diagnostic codes and criteria, you know, uh, Asperger's gone, you know, now it's, it's under the pervasive developmental continuum, no longer alcohol abuse and alcohol dependent, it's alcohol use, mild, moderate, severe. We, we've, we've had to adapt uh, the way that we diagnose and, and, and people and also the CPT codes uh, are changing as you very well know and that's how we get paid. So um, we have a, a strategy and a formula for how we treat people based on our uh, medical model. But why aren't Native Americans getting reimbursed for going to sweat lodges? Or, you know, why aren't, you know, uh, African Americans reimbursed for going to get counseling in their church? You know, I mean, culture, why, why are these things not happening? Because it doesn't fit into the formula of our European medical model. Okay? We don't recognize or value the holistic side of the culture. Lack of support for community self-determination. Uh, the majority culture is not invested in seeing the minority culture succeed in, in general, historically speaking. Re so what happens? What results in this? Racism and discrimination. They compound the impact of direct and personal trauma by allowing for the oppression of the community of peoples. I happen to be of uh, uh, Polish descent. I'm a first-generation American. My dad immigrated here through Ellis Island. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm Caucasian and and uh, uh, and I'm a male, and so I'm certainly, you know, recognized as being in the quote club of the dominant culture. Um, I didn't ask for the color of my skin or the gender that I that I am, so I, I'm not going to suggest that I, I, you know, beat myself mea culpa and and, and apologize for that. However, I do believe that I have an ethical, moral, and um, obligation, again, as a an ambassador of mental health and well-being, to recognize what is not being recognized by many of our peers within the dominant culture. And that is that entire cultures of individuals, Native Americans, African Americans, and the entire Jewish culture have been oppressed for many, many years. And hopefully we can 
be a part of the solution for that, turn that around. It's an insidious trauma that leads to a view that the world is an unsafe place for the entire group of peoples. It shapes the, li the lived experience of the individual within a given group culture. I think that's why it's important for, um, for cultures like the, the, the Judaism and Native American and African American to tr transmit what has happened historically. I think it's important to not forget what has happened to the, the heritage of uh, their lineage and the victimization and the trauma because if we remember, if they remember, because I'm not in any one of those three groups, if, if these individuals who are in the groups who, who are vulnerable to you know, cross-generational trauma, if they forget their experience, they become more vulnerable to being subjected to it again. So I, you know, I think for those of us that are, again, in the European uh, more dominant culture, let's, uh, we need to have an open mind and realize that there's reasons why people act and behave the way they do. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. This is the beginning of, of the concept of working with African Americans here. It's a condition that exists between the consequences of centuries of chattel slavery. Uh, by definition, chattel slavery is, is when, when uh, human beings are considered as, you know, uh, in the same way as personal property, they're bought and sold as commodities. And what happened is um, the, between 1865 and 1965, there was what was called the Jim Crow culture uh, it, it, that dominated the mentality that separated and differentiated between people of color and, and Caucasians. 1865, the, the uh, 13th Amendment uh, abolished slavery, but look at what we did. In 1866, the very next year, uh, we came up with a concept of convict leasing, where Alabama leased 374 state prisoners to a railroad company for a total of $5. All right? 1866, the, the onset of the KKK. Uh, so even though we legislate what would be more compassionate uh, toward our fellow our fellow humans and humanity, we find ways to get around that and perpetuate the, the theme of abusing them. Welfare rules, 68 to 75. These are, these are uh, developmental uh, periods of time that, that not only is the trauma communicated from family member to family member to generation to generation, but the society, we're making adaptations and changes to how we treat the minority culture but when you look at these, these uh, PowerPoint uh, uh, notes here, it, it shows that really we're just propitiating it. Drugs, crime, family disintegration and, and habits the inner city. You know, the exodus of jobs is to the middle class. There's no adult men in the home. Hybrid ghetto in prison. Um, historically, from a, from a forensic perspective, a legal perspective, African Americans way overrepresented in terms of being incarcerated for drug-related arrests over Caucasians. This is, uh, the police presence is more in the inner city than in, in the suburbs. This is people's responses, okay? Depression, emptiness, detachment, difficulty defending oneself. Whether it's conscious or unconscious, there, there is a sense of, of learned helplessness that you don't believe people can't change. I, I, I remember in my uh, graduate studies, we had to do some Skinner box stuff with rats. And, and if, you, if, if you shock the rat, no matter what happens, if the rat's moving toward the lever or not moving toward the lever, to, you know, if they move toward the lever and you reinforce them, it's cool. You can, you can, they can, learning can take place quickly. But if learning takes place and then you shock them, no matter what they do, they just stand in the middle of the cage and urinate and defecate and, and just quiver. And, and that's um, hard to speak about and recall. But the point is that when people have no con perceived control over change and believe in their heart that it doesn't matter what I do, nothing's going to say, it's hopelessness. It's hopelessness exponentiated to the point of uh, not making any effort to change. There's no incentive to change. So here's the conclusions that we have before we move into the solution. Um, transgenerational trauma is trauma that's transferred from one generation to others, okay? Uh, it, and it's propitiated across the, the generations. Um, the role of affect regulation, uh, regulation, narrative cohesion, and symbolic representation are potent factors in intergenerational transmission of the Holocaust experience. Um, perhaps 
this is uh, borne out by um, what we're seeing is uh, a, 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 in every, I shouldn't say every, I know where I live in Tampa, in St. Petersburg, there's a Holocaust Museum. Um, I just went to uh, uh, another city to speak. Uh, I think there was a Holocaust Museum in that city. Uh, I, I think that that makes sense that uh, we remember and, and that we take which was the things that were so horrifically uh, traumatic to peoples and what we've done to, to our fellow human beings uh, are now in, in the open light. And I think that that's important. There's a, there's a value for, for the, for the Jew, Jewish culture to keep that mindful and to pass it on to their children and their other children. However, again, um, it, it has a, 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 a factor and also uh, for some people, you know, reach, uh, transmitting the trauma from one generation to the next. I don't know the solution. I'm just, you know, stating that I think it has to happen, but um, we have to instill hope and experience and, and improve a greater degree of equity between the dominant culture and the non-dominant culture. If you can't adequately deal with this, um, you're going to wind up in judicial and welfare systems and mental health and substance abuse centers. Uh, many of us, and that's why you're listening to this talk and that's why I'm having this talk, is because many of us work with people that have not been, like remember we saw in an earlier slide, some of the Holocaust survivors, Victor Frankl being a, an example of that, actually took a horrific experience and used that to transform their life and make, their, make the world a better place through their experience. But generally speaking, many of us don't have the capacity to do that without the help of us, myself, and everyone else listening. Self-destructive behaviors in those individuals um, include aggression, adolescent suicide, alcohol and drug abuse, dependence, so sexual promiscuity, all the things that we see in our treatment centers. These are the byproducts of the trauma. A lot of, lot of ugh, you know, despair. I, I, I'm listening to myself talk, and I'm getting depressed listening to all this myself because it, it is, it is, uh, uh, there's no humor. There's nothing. There's no nothing. To, there's no humor in this at all, and it's very, very difficult to share because part of what happens for me is I see faces. I see faces of clients that I've seen here, and I'm I'm sure many of you can do the same thing. But the Native Americans came up with this concept, the Red Road to Albrighty, and you can go on whitebison.org uh, and and get the uh, Red Road to Albrighty book and be introduced to this to this. Uh, recovery model. I was fortunate enough, I'll just share, I'm a recovering addict myself, and I was fortunate enough the last time I, I got involved in recovery to, uh, to lay the, what, what was different for me this time versus other times is I, I was introduced to a group, a Native American group in St. Pete, and uh, my sponsor was a Native American of the Iroquois Nation in New York. And, uh, and so this, is the, this was the foundation in addition to my um, AA, traditional 12-step uh, groups, this is what got me sober. The Wellbriety Movement, sober lifestyles, wellness, balance, mental, physical, spiritual, emotional. I love the fact that for the Native Americans, right out of the gate, they're talking about recovery isn't just abstinence. Recovery is healing uh, in many, many ways, individual, family, community, and national. Remember we talked about those indicators that are results of intergenerational trauma? Native Americans are coming right out of the gate saying, yes, we know that this has happened to us, and we're not, going to, we're not going to hide and run from it. We're going to confront it head on. So they, they talk about connected to principles, values, and national law, natural laws. That's how they're going to get back into the equation. I remember when I was sitting in a, in a Native American meeting in St. Peter's, about seven of us. It was myself and, and six other Native Americans of different uh, uh, nation, nations. And, and I was in there for about a year. And then one other uh, Caucasian gentleman came into the room, they invited him into the group, and I remember he was sitting on my left, and there was a gentleman of, of uh, Cherokee uh, Nation on my right, and uh, it just so happens he was in his uh, Native American attire that night, because there was a powwow that weekend, and, and uh, he degenerately dressed like regular um, street clothes, but he, he had all of his attire on, and the guy on my left, I remember before the meeting even started, he looked at the, the Cherokee gentleman, and he says, you know, the difference between you and me is, I'm a Christian, I believe in one God. And you're a Native American, you believe in many gods. You have this polytheistic belief that there's many gods. And without missing a beat, I remember the gentleman looking, the, the gentleman of Cherokee, from the Cherokee Nation, the Native American, looked and looking at the Caucasian guy, and he goes, oh, no. He says, I believe in one God who has many expressions. I uh, pause for a moment. 
because um, I just want to bask in that moment. I lived, I lived in that moment. I observed that moment. And that was probably one of those life-changing experiences for me, one of those stellar moments where I got the, the, the light bulb went on. Aha, uh -huh. you know? And, uh, and I, I was blessed to be invited into the world of these very, very peaceful, gentle, spirited individuals. So they talk about walking the red road, you must create a healing forest, all right? When in, in the, the conceptualization of things from a Native American perspective is very, very circular. Uh, we scientists think of things literally, li uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, in a linear fashion, uh, even developmentally. You're born, you have uh, uh, preschool, then, you, then you, you have maturational things that happen. You have to babble before you talk, you have to crawl before you walk, then you go to school, then you have prepubescence and, and young adulthood. And, and we look at things in a linear fashion. The Native Americans look at things very in a circular manner, uh, kind of like along the medic medicine wheel concept. You always start to the east, finding the creator. If you look at, at to the right of your screen, finding the creator is where you start. You have to have a spiritual foundation between you and your creator before you can even adequately bind yourself, so to, so to speak, or in, in an Ericksonian sense, uh, crystallize your ego and identity. Before you crystallize your ego and identity, you've got to get right with the God of your understanding. Then you can, you can heal your relationships. And in that 12-step uh, talk, this is when you make an amends and things like that. And, and then they wrap it up with finding the elder's wisdom. They have a lot of value in people that have lived life and experienced life, and they have a lot of respect for their elders one of the things that's unfortunately very lacking in our dominant culture. So let's take a look at the, the healing forest. Uh, from a Native American perspective, this is all Red Road from Wild Variety uh, stuff, they talk about our roots going down into anger, guilt, shame, and fear. And you can see behind the cloud there, you can, you can begin to see all the things that are going to be brought to light as the cloud lifts. Okay? Um, how do you lift the cloud? Well. The community has to start talking. You, you know, the 12-step program talks about we're only sick as our secrets. Okay? You have to have a, an open dialogue with one another about the reality of the anger, guilt, shame, and fear that exist in your heart, in your family, in your community, and in your nation at large, and the resulting forest that grows from that sewage. You're being, you know, I... Tell people, you know, if you want to, you can't snorkel in sewage and not smell like poop. You know, uh, uh, that's about as polite as I can say it. And, and in dysfunctional families uh, and in dysfunctional communities, you can't, as you know, those of you that do couples counseling, one person can want to reconcile the relationship 200% and, and change, but if the other person is not invested in that, you can't. You cannot, you cannot reconcile a relationship when only one person is working on it. So here's how we start the recovery community. Uh, you address all of these, these things that are late, your roots are planted in, and you use a medicine wheel and the 12 steps. They, what the Native Americans have done is they've integrated the traditional 12 steps of AA into their Native American belief system, as I said, the philosophy that we were talking about. And now the cloud is lifted. We're talking. Mm -hmm. We're engaging in, in culture. We're engaging in ceremony. We're, we're rekindling our spiritual foundation and we're aspiring to live a life of recovery, not a life of abstinence, a life of recovery, healing for the mind, body, soul, and community. And part of that is by recognizing that not everyone who's an alcoholic or an addict escapes this toxicity, okay? Not every Native American, not every person of, uh, uh, of Jewish culture, not every African American uh, becomes a drug addict or a perpetrator upon other people. But you can't, you can't come from this heritage, uh, this hundreds of years of, 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 of persecution on your, your ancestors and come out without having some issues of, you know, the battered woman's syndrome that, that some people talk about. I mean, how, do, how does that develop? How does, how does a person, I, I saw a client yesterday who was a, a, an educated person in my private practice who just got out of a 16-year relationship who was chronically abused throughout the whole time, a bright, successful, educated woman. And uh, it's going to be a privilege and an honor to be a part of her recovery journey, but yet it's, it, it always, I find it very difficult to hear that, um, that people uh, are so traumatized and re-victimized by the trauma, that they're immobilized. Remember the, the example of the rat in a cage? Can't even move, can't do anything to help themselves. 
Here's how you get healthy. You apply the principles, values, and laws of the Red Road to your life, your family, and your community. And as the, as the cloud lifts, this is what you're going to wind up with. You know, sober leaders, healthy youth, healthy men, traditional communities, healthy women, and all of these forests. You see all the people that are now uh, uh, gathering around these trees? Uh, there's a community that rises up out of forgiving the unforgivable. How do you forgive the Holocaust experience? How do you forgive the Trail of Tears? You know, how do you forgive slavery? I am not one of those people, so I don't really have to. I think I, from the neck up, I, I get what needs to happen, uh, but from the neck down existentially and experientially, I have no understanding of that. As a recovering alcoholic, I know that if I, if I harbor resentments and, and, and take into account wrong suffered, I'm going to go back out. So I, to, to a little degree, I do understand the necessity for giving, uh, but the unforgivable. Healing, unity, hope, traditional values, uh, lead to spirituality, a resurrection of your culture and your tradition, and you have sober powwows. Remember I said the uh, Cherokee gentleman on my right at that meeting was going to a powwow that weekend. How do they re resurrect this? They get their language back. They get the cultural values back. And going on that circle, you listen to the elders' teaching. Uh, and then you apply the principles, laws, and values that have worked in your culture for thousands of years to you know, your post trauma culture. The thing I like about the Native Americans, we're almost done here, wrapping it up for, for questions, is that they see the value of, uh, since you have problems that are comorbid and uh, multidimensional, you need uh, many different modalities of intervention, you know, from, from community to, to schools to, to your church. Medicine wheel, Again, I said it has four different, three, uh, four different sides to it, and they use that as a kind of a, an, uh, a symbolic representation of, of spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental. And here's the steps, the steps they apply. Remember, we're starting with the east. And this is how we're going to wrap this up. These are the uh, Red Road steps. East is recognizing, finding your creator. Remember the spiritual, the intra-psychic healing that must take place. The south is acknowledging, finding ourselves. Okay, That's where you start the first three steps in, in getting a spiritual foundation. Then four through six is you know purging, cleansing, doing some introspective analysis. Seven through nine is where you're making right in your community. And 10 through 12, finding the elders' wisdom, which includes you've got to give it away to keep it. There we go. Okay. Got that done in an hour. Okay, we have some uh, questions here. Uh, start with uh, April. Uh, can you elaborate on denial of cultural heritage by older family members? Um, again, I'm an outsider looking in, so, mm -hmm. so I can elaborate on it. From my interpretation is that perhaps some of the older family members were so in, impacted adversely and incapacitated by the trauma themselves that they perceive um, that not not talking about the Holocaust, not talking about slavery, not talking about you know the Trail of Tears is a way to protect your children. So I would that's the way I would frame it. I would frame it as for those that choose not to share the story. I would like to think that maybe part of it is because that's the way they're trying to protect their youth. The other part of it could be just you know denial as a part of if there's a comorbidity going on and people also have a substance use disorder. You know denial is the hallmark. Of, of anyone who has a substance use disorder. So that's how I would address that. James, I am curious how this has impacted the, uh, okay, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community. Um, are they included in these studies? Good question. Um, no, I don't believe so. And, and if you're asking this question, I'm sure you realize that, shame on us, myself included, as a, as, as a healthcare community of mental health providers that we have so uh, ignored this population that has been, you know, certainly uh, discriminated against and, and suffered violently. Um, so no, I do not believe that they, they were included in the study, but would be awesome, that would make an awesome study to try and apply the Red Road program to a community like that and see if that, if that, if that could instill some hope in their hopelessness. I'm sorry, I wish I could say it has been done, but not to my knowledge. Scarlett, 
with the recent influx of children fleeing their country and arriving in the U.S., do you suppose that some of the children may also suffer intergenerational trauma? Absolutely. I, I've been uh, blown away, for lack of a better term, at the, at the refuge here over the last four years. Uh, they've gotten a, lot, a number of children who are uh, uh, adopted out of orphanages in, uh, in Russia, in China, uh, and by wonderfully loving, caring, compassionate uh, families that are educated and on the upper end of the socioeconomic strata and have provided every single opportunity for their children to thrive and grow. And yet they have not done so. They have, they have uh, developed substance use disorders early on, behavioral disorders, conduct disorders, and now wind up here at, at the refuge in, you know, in their 20s uh, with, you know, a history of at least five or six years of active addiction and acting out behavior that has um, not has hasn't been responsive to the legal consequences of prior therapeutic interventions. So I would agree. I would think people, uh, children from other countries, are going to even though they're adopted in loving, caring families, they're still going to have some difficulties and challenges. Shay, how are we doing? Is that good? Is okay, that yeah, guys, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you so that if you have some questions you'd like to ask Dr. Tom, um, I just ask it if you please, if you don't have a question, to please mute your phone so that those who do have questions can be heard. So give me just one second, and we'll get you guys open. You are now unmuted. Hi, Tom here. Hi. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Tom? Yes, uh, Dr. Antioch, thank you. Uh, Eric Elstrowing here. Um, I'm just confused on how do you, how does one separate behavioral trauma from or psychological trauma and behavioral when you know epigeneticism is proving that there's really not a disconnect anymore between psycho psychological and physiological. Um, fair criticism, Eric. I mean, um, I. I would have to defer and say, yes, I agree with you. Um, the way I, I define it, it, we categorize, you're right though, I'm not going to try and defend myself. Um, I might even take a look at that and redefine that. Thanks for, for that uh, challenge. We in this field know that you know uh, psychological manifestations of trauma have, and especially here at the, at the refuge, they do a lot of somatic experience, do a lot of somatic interventions, and it, and they really are so interconnected that you really can't dif differentiate. I was just for the for the for the lack of uh, as an ac academic exercise, I was categorizing them. Fair fair criticism. I think I'll I'll change that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions for Dr. Antonek? No? Well, we very much appreciate you guys taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you all and reading your evaluations. If you have any questions about how to get your CE credit, please do not hesitate to call me. Uh, my cell number is 352-512-8877. Seven, seven, and you can also find all the forms that you'll need in the emails that we sent out and on our website. So thank you very much, and we look forward to having you join us next time. Thank you.